What's up, y'all? We'll get started in about 10. Oh, cool. Thank you, M.A. Appreciate the sub.
All right, all right. What's up, players? We'll go ahead and get started here. Good to see you guys. So uh, if you're new, this is uh, my channel, which is uh, Shikata Ganai. And I do a variety of different uh, tutorials on YouTube. I post all kinds of them on LinkedIn, which is where you guys probably saw this from. And uh, I do a variety of different channels. And one of the channels I do is called uh, Pop, 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 Another Server Drop, where we use CTFs, Capture the Flag, and War Games to teach uh, cybersecurity principles. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you guys have questions, I put it at about a five-second delay uh, so that I can make sure... I can see things <laughs> as the chat goes through. This is my first time doing the live stream from YouTube. So let me know if the audio and everything is coming through. And if it's not, let me know uh, so we can fix that issue. But I believe it should. everything should be working just fine with it. Um, so on my website here, I've got this Shikata Ganai. Uh, what you were hearing there was just kind of my original album where I do music to hack to. And I use uh, live looping and all kinds of cool stuff like that. Oh, okay. Cool. IT engineer. Awesome. All right, MA. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, this is an, an album I made just for music to hack to, for people to code and, and, and blast away and pop the box and all that kind of cool stuff. So my website has main, some main categories. You have bounty hunter training, which deals with um, bug bounty stuff, such as teaching you some basics of web app hacking and uh, concepts like the OWASP top 10, things like that. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. I got a lot of cool videos there for that particular one. Uh, things like command injection, XML, entity injection, all kinds of different interesting things. And then I have this other series called Pop, 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 Another Server Drop. And this is where I grab some capture the flags in war games. And I teach security comm sets by kind of slowing the, gro slowing the roll down and teaching the different methods behind why an attacker would go a certain way or they may use certain commands to break into a machine, that sort of thing. So I take it a little bit more verbose than you would see on a normal, uh, what do you call it, walkthrough, I guess, for these uh, CTFs. And so I got a ton of different videos in that particular series. The, the newest one I just dropped, I didn't put up here yet, but I'm going to. And then I also have an essentials series. So for those that are just beginning to get into this in industry, one of them is this MITRE one that we're going to be talking about tonight. But I also have some different uh, common things that we would see, things like SQL injections. Um, but I also have um, malware creation using things like Metasploit. These are older videos, so they're not uh, going to be looking like they do here today. <laughs> but either way, still good content. And I also have in there some things like some Linux, exp uh, Linux basics and how to create your, um, your own... Uh, VM, virtual machine. I also have that on my YouTube channel as well. So if you check out my YouTube channel that you're on now and you look at the different videos, you'll see there's a variety of different ones that are listed in there as well. So uh, yeah, anytime you want to go ahead and learn a little bit more about some of this stuff, you can either check here at Chicago Ganai or you can check out my LinkedIn for all that kind of good stuff there as well. So a little bit about myself. I teach um, the, I, in my free time, I teach a lot of the cybersecurity stuff. But in my real job, I'm actually a cyber threat intel and red team uh, lead over at trinet.com. So um, I, love, I love working there. I love doing what I do. And I just love kind of just giving information about cybersecurity because I've been where everybody's at, starting in the industry and wanting to know, hey, what do I do next? How do I become more so in this actual industry? And a lot of times it comes down to self-learning in this community because there are some environments that they'll hold things close to chest but that's been changing over the years with uh, youtube channels like uh, john hammond's and uh, the cyber mentor and things like that they've been doing a real good job of just displaying tons of information for everybody uh real cool stuff so i'm trying to make my little mark in this little world here for this and um so i have i, I in my previous life i also had done training for about 12 years where i taught certified ethical hacking i try i taught for uh, microsoft a certified Microsoft trainer, a CompTIA trainer, EC Council. So I've taught a variety of different things. I got 21 certifications in that, and I've just added a new one for the topic that we're talking about today. So MITRE Attack actually teamed up with this MITRE Ingenuity, 
and they created a course and a certification to be an expert in this attack framework. So I went ahead and uh, earned that certification here, as you can see, the last one there on May. So this one here is a cyber threat intelligence certification. So I'm gonna be taking some of the information that I learned from that course and disseminating it here today as well. So very cool stuff, very cool. All right, so let's get right on into the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So in the world of cyber threat intel, we know currently out there in the world that a lot of the big attacks going on that we see every day in the news is things like ransomware. You see Ryuk and TrickBot and, and uh, Emotet and all these other different ones that are just blasting everybody. And a lot of times that comes down to the fact that these companies are not doing good or proper backups or they're not actually testing their backups to see if they can restore because essentially if the attacker decides to stick with a single-minded focus of just encrypting your files and saying, hey, give me some Bitcoin so I can uh, send you a decrypted key, you can kind of mitigate that if you have a pretty recent backup uh, as an offsite backup that you can put on. A lot of the times you'll notice that in some companies they think that having these multiple backups doing the three, two, one method, if you will, um, is sufficient. But a lot of times they, they neglect the offsite tape backup or whatever medium you want to use for offsite. Because what happens is attackers generally, when it comes to ransomware, they'll generally get into the network early and maybe six months, let's say they're in the network and they're just kind of watching and monitoring. They're seeing, okay, where do they send their backups? Where do they send, uh, you know, different files and stuff? What kind of databases are they using? And then from there, when the attack actually happens, they'll already have destroyed or encrypted those online backups. So the key thing is you always have to have an offline backup. And it's difficult because, again, it comes down to physically transporting a backup to a physical location and the duplication or the replication of the actual data in real time is, is a little bit more difficult. So you won't have the most up-to-date data in most cases, but it's still the best way to test your restore, like a disaster recovery, is to check an off-site backup and do it that route. Um, so pretty interesting stuff, but I'm, I'm kind of segueing in to what this MITRE attack is, is all about. So... With this MITRE attack, it's a free framework that you don't, you know, you don't have to pay for. And what they've done is they've gathered information throughout the years of all these different real attacks that have happened. And they basically split things up into tactics, techniques, and procedures. And you'll hear that term called TTP. If you see the term listed on some of these different uh, sites, you'll see it labeled as that. And they'll say, okay, here's the technique that bad guys have used for this particular one. And there's also a thing that if you look it up online or Google it, it's called Pyramid of Pain. It's a very common, uh, it's a very common thing that a lot of uh, cyber threat intel people will look at because it, it kind of outlines what, the, what would cause the, the attacker the most consternation in their, <laughs> in their dastardly deed doing. And at the top of the list is TTPs, meaning that it would really put them out if they have to change their tactics and techniques and procedures constantly. They like to kind of stick with what they've known and what's worked. And so those, those are the things that we want to kind of hone in on. And that's why MITRE ATT&CK is great because it's just one massive repository of all this information already at our fingertips. So if we want to actually design an incident response or design a playbook of some sort to mitigate and be proactive for ransomware and Ryuk and TrickBot and all these other ones out there, this is the site that you want to kind of get on. Now, there are some other tools that you'll notice out there. Like if you're if you're part of a cyber threat intel, there'll be different uh, threat intel platforms and they'll ingest information from MITRE ATT&CK or they'll map the data they have to MITRE ATT&CK. And it's kind of cool because they'll, they'll actually put it, you know, identifier numbers by it. So it gives it a lot of it gives it a lot of organization, if you will. At my workplace, when I was asked to start doing tabletops, I proposed using this because in this case, I can red team offensively and I can do a particular attack that I know is mapped to a MITRE ATT&CK technique or a tactic 
And then I can go ahead and discuss it with the incident response team to say, here's what you should have done to mitigate what I did, right? And, and teach them to use this particular MITRE attack. So at your workplace, this would be pretty cool if you can kind of maybe tell your, uh, your, your leadership or tell the incident response, hey, listen, you know, learn about this MITRE attack thing here, and we should probably use this to design some sort of response or some sort of playbooks that we can use for uh, defense. So let's uh, tackle and see exactly what this MITRE attack includes. So you start off by looking at this. It has these matrices. So they have a variety of different things. This pre right here has been uh, has uh, gone away as of the newer version. But you have different things. When it says enterprise, they're talking about a basic networked company. So just pick any major company. That would be considered enterprise. Now, when you actually want to get into cloud or mobile, there's some different tactics and techniques and procedures that they use for that. So that's where they're at. For this today, we're going to be talking about the enterprise one. So on the enterprise matrix, you'll see below there's a variety of different things that are listed across the top and down on the column. So what they have on the top here is you have what they call tactics. And what they do basically here is they're saying this is the overall goal of the bad guy. For instance, initial access, that's an overall goal. If I was an attacker and I wanted to drop some ransomware, Ryuk or what have you, I want to get initial access. Now, in the case of ransomware and Emotet and TrickBot and all these other ones, the, the major one these days that gets them initial access to download TrickBot and start committing, you know, making a C2 connection is this fission right here. So the tactic is initial access. That's the goal of the bad guy. The technique that they can use or have used in the past to get initial access is these down here in the column. So specifically this one, fission. Now these techniques also, as you see a number right there, that one says three, also has sub techniques. So if you expand that out, this would be a very common one, right? Spear fission attachment. So in the case of something like Emotet or TrickBot or Ryuk, typically it will come in the form of a macroed Word document, right? So they download the Word document attachment, they enable macros, and then from you know, then then we're off to the races. It downloads with obfuscated PowerShell, you know, downloads the the uh, TrickBot, and then from there, TrickBot will then cre create a C2 connection and then download Ryuk and so on and so forth. But when planning your defense and planning your incident response, you want to look and first determine, well, what is the goal first? And then what are the techniques below it? Now, again, there may be more techniques and they do accept submissions of if you, if you know or have had done to you some certain tactic or technique that's not listed here, they do take submissions and they will review them and possibly put them into the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So in this case here, when we go up to tactics, we'll go look at a tactic and we'll look at enterprise. These are all the tactics that they kind of compiled everything into. So in the real world, you can say threat actors, APTs, all these bad guys, these are kind of what the main goals are for all of them. Reconnaissance, resource development, initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense evasion, credential access, discovery, lateral movement, collection, command and control, exfiltration, and impact. So knowing that information, you can start to design your playbooks. So if you want to prevent initial access of Ryuk or, or some trick bot or whatever, you, whatever malware, pick your poison, you would start off with the tactic of initial access. So if you click on initial access over on the left, it'll actually start listing out here the ID number. And this is what we use to make sure it's organized in the company that you work at. In this case here, below it are the different techniques that can give access to uh, initial access into a system. So your red team that works for your company can actually use this and map it and create simulated attack scenarios of this. So you can have your red team create a drive-by compromise and they can perform that in their red team exercise or their tabletop. And then they can point the incident response team to this ID number. So they can say in their after action review, after they've blasted them to, to oblivion, 
they can click on this and say, hey, all right, incident response, let's sit down and talk about this. And they'll talk about this particular one here. And they'll say, these are where the data sources are. The permissions required doesn't, doesn't need admin access, just a standard user. And then down here, it gives a description of the actual, what the attack is. And then down below, these are actual real world examples of what has already happened by known attackers out in the world. So for example, AP19 is a group that is well known, according to MITRE here. It is a Chinese based threat group that has targeted a variety of industries like defense, finance, energy, pharmaceuticals, so on and so forth. And this would go into your actual creation of like a playbook. You would actually start looking at some of the groups and you would say, okay, I work in the energy sector. What groups do I need to look at that typically target energy, you know, the energy sector? And then from there, you start looking at what are some of the things they've used before, because that will likely be relevant to your company to protect against. So in that particular case, like I said, here they got an APT 49 or whatever, or I'm sorry, APT 19. And it says here they performed a water and hole attack on Forbes.com in 2014 to compromise the target. And then here you got footnotes that kind of lead to the articles uh, describing that real world event. So this whole MITRE attack framework is sourced from things that have happened. So these are real world events that you can look at and say, hey, listen, you know, this has happened and it's likely it's going to happen again. Again, we go back to that pyramid of pain. The, the most consternation of a bad guy <laughs> that they don't want to change if they don't have to is their techniques, their tactics, techniques, and procedures. So if it's worked in the past, even 2014, it's likely they'll probably try it again until it's actually found and defended against properly. Then they'll probably move on to something else. But that's where that correlation with pyramid of pain comes into play there. So again, this is just an example of one particular technique where you can actually look down through it and see different procedure examples. And then as you scroll down towards the bottom, they will also tell you some typical mitigations that you would use to prevent this. This is where you start making your playbook for incident response. You can say, okay, this is what we need to do to mitigate this actually happening to us. So you want to be proactive, especially when it comes to ransomware. Um, so they give you some ideas like application isolation and sandboxing, like using the Windows sandbox, something like that. Restricting web-based content, those sort of things. They also get verbose about the detections. And again, you would probably talk with the incident response team and say, listen, do we have a managed service provider? Are we, are we monitoring constantly different IOCs from known threat actors and things like that? This is where you can say for the detection, this is what we need to be looking for. We need to be looking for suspicious files written to disk. We need to look and see if there's any process injection with DLLs because they're trying to impersonate a service that has NT authority, something to that effect. So that's where this whole thing comes into play when it looks at detection, okay? Over here on the far corner here, we have mitigations. And there, again, under enterprise, this will also be broken in here by, you know, specific, specific mitigations that tie into the techniques and tactics that they're used for. Now, if you actually know the group that you're looking for, you can look under groups as well. So, for example, if you are concerned about Ryuk or ransomware, a typical threat actor is Wizard Spider. So in that case, you would go here and you would look for Wizard Spider over on the left. Now, they don't have all threat actors, but they have a really good amount. <laughs> so in this case here, we can see Wizard Spider likes to use ransomware campaigns. And as you scroll down to the bottom here, we can also see that there are some other associated groups that are kind of known affiliates, if you will, that we can also keep an eye on as well. And then down below, we can see what has Wizard Spider done specifically in their different attacks? In this case, they've identified domain admins using this particular domain admin command. Um, they've established persistence via a registry key. So the mitigation or detec detection would be, do you monitor this folder? So if you monitor that folder, you may be able to see that sort of compromise. So as you go down through, you start looking and seeing, okay, they install TrickBot. And that would then likely download Ryuk, which would then 
bring the C2 channel uh, to get some decryption, I'm sorry, get encryption keys to actually start encrypting the files that are on the machine. And now you have your ransomware attack happening. So these are, like I said, all real world events, real world actors that are still in play. And again, period of pain, they don't like to change techniques, tactics, and procedures if they don't have to. So you can see there's quite a bit of stuff that these cats are into, man, a lot of different stuff. You can also look at the software they're using. And if you actually look at these, you can start setting up your app locker or whatever you may use for application restriction. And you can start looking for these tools particularly. You can say, I'm going to block any instance I see of Bloodhound, which is an Active Directory enumeration attack framework. Cobalt Strike is typically used as a uh, red team kind of thing where they have C2 connections called Beacon. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with Cobalt Strike. So those would be different signatures that would be uh, apparent to that. And these are some of the things that this software does. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting how they have it all listed out here. Emotet is an example of one which has been recently kind of shut down part of it, <laughs> or the FBI is actually in the process of, of trying to shut down as many as they can. But uh, these were, I think they were involved with the one of the latest ones. I think the, I'm not sure if there was a colonial one or not, but um, either way. So in this particular case, that's where you can look under groups. And the same thing with software as well. So let's go ahead and walk through a way that you can use MITRE to actually get information and start creating a playbook of sorts for Ryuk. Before I continue though, I wanna ask and see if anybody has any questions because uh, I see the lab chat here. We got about six people, which is pretty awesome. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, do you have any questions for me? I, I set the chat to like a five second delay in between chats, that way I can hopefully see it so it doesn't scroll very fast. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll pause for just a moment and see if you guys have anything currently you wanna ask. And again, I actively use this at my workplace. Uh, so I am definitely a proponent of it. I have my certification in it, so I'm loving it. It's good stuff. Okay. I don't see anybody typing anything in. No questions? Okay, we'll continue. So what you would do in this case, let's pretend that your CISO has tasked you, the, the cyber threat intel guy, with giving information about how we can prevent Ryuk. Ryuk is an example of some ransomware that's pretty popular these days. So what you can do is you can type in the word Ryuk in the search box on MITRE, okay? It doesn't have to be searching for just techniques or tactics, just look for Ryuk. So here we see Ryuk software, okay? So let's click that. So we now know the Ryuk software here and we know kind of what it does by looking at a short description of it. And uh, as you scroll down to, to, down to here, we can start seeing some of the techniques used. Now in this particular case, this is pretty verbose as far as, uh, or detailed with its actual uses. For example, Ryuk has attempted to adjust its token privileges to have the SE debug privilege. And it will typically try to do that after you do some research by seeing that they actually go ahead and um, uh, try to impersonate a token for like a, something that has this particular SE debug privilege. Uh, where, did I, where did I get my cert for MITRE? It's over here, it's uh, called MAD, MAD.MITRE, MITRE Ingenuity. Uh, they partnered with MITRE and they created the two courses, Cyber Threat Intelligence Certification and a SOC. So if you're part of the SOC, this is another certification you can get here. And they basically, um, you, you pay for it, you pay for the, the service, and you first get training under here. You go to training, and then from there, you start doing the training for that particular certification that you want. What you will have to do is get a Cybrary account. So if you don't have a free account at Cybrary, they use Cybrary to, develop, to deliver the content, the videos. Um, so you'll sign up at Cybrary, you'll click in your, whatever your uh, login is, and then from there, you'll actually go ahead and do the course. And then when you're done, you come back and you do these examples, these get certifieds here. Um, and each one will say on below is a take assessment. And then when you're done, well, you get your badge, <laughs> you get your certification. They don't actually have anything to print out, but uh, right here it says, 
I have the Cyber Threat Intelligence Certification. So that's number 22 for me. <laughs> so hopefully I answered your question. Uh, MITRE Ingenuity Program. All right, let's jump on back here to Ryuk Software. So again, on this here, if we're starting to make our playbook now for instant response, we're saying, hey, we know some of the things we need to be looking for. We know they like to use Windows Command Shell to create a registry entry. We know that they like to establish persistence by adding registry keys in this location, okay? So if you start tackling these one at a time, you can go ahead and let's say, for instance, let's grab this one. I can say, well, let me look at this technique, okay? And the technique number is listed there, T1134, okay? So if you go and look at the access token one, this is where you can start looking down through. And this is kind of where you would do your discussion with the incident response team or the SOC or whoever's doing the uh, remediation or incidents. And you would say, all right, let's, let's, let's talk about this. And as you go down through, you'll see there's some different procedure examples. But what you want to go down to is this mitigation section here. So in this case here, here's an example of one. Limit permissions so that users and user groups cannot create tokens. So they get into pretty good detail about what you would do to mitigate this particular problem that Ryuk is known for from happening. Uh, same thing with this one here, user account management, but then they also get down to detection. Now in this particular case, because of that SED bug privilege log on that I was talking about, this is one you wanna look for here is impersonate logged on user for the Windows API, because that's one that will kind of let you know, will kind of tip you off that there's something nefarious going on here likely um, that you should probably look into. Now, it may not be nefarious, but it's something worth looking into for Ryuk and keeping an eye on it. So when you make your playbook, you can start with just this one. And you can say, all right, these are certain things that happen. Now, this Sunspot one, I think, was recently used in the FireEye one, I think. It was either FireEye or the SolarWinds one where they had the supply chain attack. I think, actually, I think it was the, I think it was the, um, Solar winds. Anyways, this is an example of one here, but you can start looking down through here. But the one you're really focused on for this is this one right here. Okay. So it says Ryuk has attempted to adjust his token privileges to have this SE debug privilege. This is the one that we're concerned with. And this is the one we want to write up and, and be proactive about to make sure we're monitoring and mitigating this from happening. Okay. That's the main key there. Um, so Knowing that information, that's just one example of one there. So we come back here to Ryuk, and as we scroll down, you can see there is a ton of them. But then we can also look at the groups that use this software as well, because you may want to see if they actually attack anything in your industry that you work in. Um, now, obviously, you should still be proactive, but even more so if they're actually known to attack your industry that you currently work in. So these are two known ones here, Wizard Spider and Fin6. So we'll get into that in just a minute when I talk about Navigator. And then down below here are the actual real world references that you can look at for the attacks that have happened within Ryuk. So you got you got your work cut out for you for sure because like I said, there's a lot of different techniques. Now they have a tool <coughs> called the Attack Navigator and I'm gonna go to it right over here. And this tool here, I'm gonna show you kind of how to use it and then from there, we'll go back to Ryuk and look at the one that they've created just for Ryuk to kind of compare. So we're going to actually create a Navigator one for these two cats right here, Wizard Spider and Fin6. Okay, and we may even add in Ryuk and see what happens. So Attack Navigator is something that they host themselves, but you can actually host it locally as well. What you're going to do is you're going to create what they call layers. So I'm going to create a new layer. And then here, I'm gonna choose Enterprise. And that's gonna give me this view here. Now, there's a lot of, uh, I've made my screen a lot bigger so you guys can see it a little bit better. So there's gonna be a lot of up and down and movement to the side and all this other stuff because <laughs> there's too much here. So anyways, in this case here, we have all the different tactics on the top and then all the techniques and sub-techniques that go with them. Now, if I want to find out and get some information about those two in particular, the goal of using this tool is to see if both of those use the same technique at all. If they don't use the same techniques, it makes your job a little more difficult because now you have a lot more things to be proactive about. But if they use 
three different techniques and tactics between the two of them, then you know you can set your priority and say, those three I need to really put high on my list to make sure we're not, you know, we're not missing the boat on it because that's the one that most them most of them actually use. So to do this, you have some different menu items up here on the top. So you have a basic search, you have a multi-select, which we're going to do in just a second. And then you got some techniques and some different layer information. You can also you can, you can also expand all the sub techniques or you can collapse them back down. Plus there's all kinds of different formatting you can do and you can actually export it as a picture, you can export it as an Excel. So all kinds of cool stuff. So let's start off by clicking here where it says multi-select. And because we're actually looking at the threat groups, Wizard, Spider, and Fin6, we're gonna go ahead and make this layer Wizard, Spider. So we're gonna look under threat group specifically for Wizard, Spider. And I'm gonna select it like that. Now this is kind of a wonky interface, so you have to click here to get rid of that little menu. Now over here on the far right, there's some different technique controls and you can set different background colors for different severity if you want. The way I do this is I set a score. And the, what I do is, is I just give the first tab I have a one. Now again, you can use, any, use this any way that you choose. I'm just showing you the way that I like to do it. So now all of these things that I've highlighted in red are things that are known to be have been done technique wise and tactics by Wizard Spider. So if you know Wizard Spider is it, it attacks your industry that you work in, you need to be concerned with these items. Okay? Of course the other things are problematic, but you know now without a doubt for efficiency's sake, you know you need to focus just on these things that are red. Now even more so than that, we want to find out and dial down even deeper and find out if another similar group uses any of these same techniques and tactics. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and call this layer, rename it by double clicking it. So I'll say wizard spider, just like that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new layer. And again, I'm gonna choose enterprise. Now there are more options you can choose if you want. Uh, for me, I just go with you know whatever the version is that we have and the domain being enterprise. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click on create. And again, we're, we're shown this same view. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go multi-select again, and this time we're gonna look for the other one, which was Fin6. I think it was Fin6, let's double check, yep. So Fin6 is right there, so we'll select that. So what I'll do now is I'll come back over far to the right, where it says scoring, and I'll give this a score of two. So anything that actually has a two, as its number, if you will, that you'll see in a moment, I know is related to Fin6. So let me go ahead and name that layer, okay? And just for giggles, let's go ahead also and throw in Ryuk while we're here. So we'll go ahead and create another new layer, Enterprise. And this time we'll go ahead and look at the Tools software section and look for Ryuk. So we'll scroll down and there's Ryuk right there. We'll select it. And again, we'll come over here and we'll give this one a score of three. And again, you can choose any way you want. And if you look here at the background color, I'm sorry, the, um, where is it at? <laughs> Matrix color setup. Here you can actually choose the color gradients. You can say the lower value of number one is red while the number three is green or something to that effect, right? You can mess with all this stuff, but we won't get into that today. So I've given this a three, and I'm gonna call this one Ryuk. So we have three layers now that we are creating. And again, you would use this at your workplace to create some playbooks and preventative measures. Next, what we're gonna do is create another layer, but this time it's gonna be a create layer from other layers. When you click that, you'll see these highlight up here on the top, and they say A, B, and C, all the way to the top. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose our domain being enterprise, and then the expression is gonna be A plus B plus C. Those are the tabs I wanna combine. So I'm gonna go ahead now and not worry about all this other verbose stuff and just click Create. All right. Now, you'll notice all kinds of different colors now. 
And you'll also notice when you hover over them, there's different scores. Now, if I hover over this one, you see where it says, I don't know if you can see that very well or not. It says a score of one. Now, if you recall, the first one I did was Wizard Spider and I gave it a score of one. So knowing this, by looking at this right now, I can tell that Fin6 and Ryuk do not use this technique. So let's verify that by clicking on Fin6. And indeed, they do not use it. Ryuk, indeed, they do not use it. So in this case here, we know this one is by itself. Now, in priority thinking, this one may be lower in your priority of eyes on. However, if you start moving up into this, where it says five, now we're starting to see, okay, this is actually being used by multiple different groups. So we know we have three, two, and one, okay? So there's likely two of these, three and two, three plus two gives you five. There's likely two of these that use this access token manipulation. So if we take a look here at Fin6, we can see, yes, that one uses it. Look at Ryuk, yes, that one uses it. And look at Wizard Spider, it doesn't use it. So we know, because of the number five, this one I gave a score of three, this one I gave a score of two. Three plus two is five. And there we go. This one is more of a concern to me because two of known threat actors and software use this. So this is now something that's more common. Now, if I start going down through, and again, you can change this color in to say uh, something different. Like you may say green is only one and red is when there's multiples. And you can do that all from this color setup. So if we look, we can see if there's any of them that actually are solid green, because that would indicate uh, that they're all using the same thing. And it doesn't look like we have any. So if there was a bright green, that would tell me that all three of them use that same technique. Okay, does that make sense so far? And again, if you look at this one here, it says two. So this is likely <laughs> is going to be just Fin6. So in this case, if I look at Fin6, I can see indeed it is for that. Ryuk doesn't have it. Wizard Spider doesn't have it. Okay. So in that case there, when you see and hover over it and it says score of two, that's where it is. So if you were really concerned about the access token manipulation, because you know both Ryuk and Fin6 use the same technique and the same category of tactic, you can right click on it and you can say, I need to view that technique and find out some details about it. And click on view technique and it will open up the technique page. How awesome is that, right? So from there, you can start looking down through, read what it does. You can determine what platform it's using. So if you're a Windows house or if you do have Windows servers for your domain or whatever, you know this is what it attacks. You do know that it can take administrator or user privileges to be able to do this and, and be effective at it. And then down below here, you can see the data sources from which this particular technique is coming from. And then down below, um, there's some other different information. But as you scroll down here, you can see procedure examples. In this case, we can see Fin6 has used Metasploit's named pipe impersonation technique to escalate their privileges. So now we're dialing them down in detail. So first we went to our navigator and we said, and we listed out all three that are, you know, categorized as being grouped together with ransomware. And we said, we're really concerned about this one because two of them, you know, share that same technique. So going down and looking a little deeper at it, we now see specifically how it's been used before. So now we know for our red team or for incident response to tell them, hey, listen, using this particular name pipe impersonation technique, that's what they're doing to escalate privileges. Now we also know that Ryuk was used, uh, uses this technique as well. And we can see here that Ryuk has attempted to adjust its token privilege to have the SE debug privilege. So that's how we could actually use Navigator to determine what we're actually looking at and what our priorities are. And then from there for your uh, higher ups, you can export it to Excel. You can just save and render the layer to an SVG if you want. And uh, you can download it as JSON. So there's a variety of ways you can output it out as well. So I'll take a brief second here to pause and see if you guys have any questions. So 
It's a lot to ingest, <laughs> but pretty cool stuff. Definitely will help you with uh, creating playbooks and instant response stuff as well. All right. Okay, I don't see anybody tapping anything for questions. All right, so we'll continue. So now we know how to use the Navigator tool to be able to create our own plan, as it were. But you can also go right back here to the Ryuk software itself. And right up here, you can see the Attack Navigator layer. They've already done it for us. So we can click it and view it. And there we go. Now what they've done is they've actually expanded all of the sub techniques. And up here you have that ability to collapse that or expand it. So if I want to collapse it, it makes it in that view. And if I want to expand it, it opens them all up. Okay. So these are the things, like I said, for Ryuk specific things that you need to be aware of and be kind of taken account of when you're doing your mitigation techniques, okay? So it's kind of cool that the MITRE ATT&CK website goes ahead and, and does that for you for all of these different types. They already kind of create the navigator layer for you, which is pretty awesome. So in that particular case, let's uh, close that one out there. Yes, we don't need that. So it's pretty awesome that you have this tool here to be able to do all this different stuff here. Now, do keep in mind as well, when you're looking at this, you may think, well, wait a minute, there's not very many. But if you look at them, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but it says here three of eight beside this command and script and interpreter. So it may look, just at first glance, that under execution, this is the only one that's up here on the top. But because it says three of eight, that tells me there's three other ones that are in sub-techniques. So if I click this, I can see that. Now, remember I was saying before that when we're thinking about priority, we need to think about which ones are shared the most amongst them. Now, originally here, just a second ago, we saw this one have a score of five. And that told me that Ryu can Fin6 share it, but not Wizard Spider. So we don't have complete correlation across all three of them. However, once we've expanded this command and script and interpreter, we see this Windows command shell has a number six. That tells me the number three for Ryu, the number two for Fin6, and the number one for Wizard Spider. Add them all together, and you have six. So top of your priority list for creating your playbook and creating your incident response is Windows command shell. That is one of the most important that you need to do or look into and figure out how to mitigate um, when you're making your plan. So again, you right-click it, view the technique, and then from there, you can scroll down and look and see how they all did it. So as we've seen, we have Fin6 right uh, here. So Fin6 used kill.bat script to disable security tools. And then we had, uh, what was the other one? Ryuk. Ryuk. Scroll down right there. It looks like Ryuk has used cmd.exe to create a registry entry to establish persistence. And then lastly, we had Wizard Spider. And it looks like Wizard Spider has used cmd.exe to execute commands on a victim's machine, typically called living off the land attacks. So in this particular case here, we now know all three of them use this. So this is a very well-used and very common technique being used here for ransomware, specifically Ryuk in this case here uh, as well. So down below, we see the mitigations execution prevention use application control so essentially they're saying don't allow administrative access to open command prompt as a, as administrator or, or something to that effect or maybe disable the ability to have a user access command pro, command prompt those sort of things and then down below tells you about the script the uh, detection usage of the windows command shell may be common on administrators but if scripting is restricted for normal users then any attempt to enable scripts running on a system would be considered suspicious Let's keep in mind, they're going to be trying to break in first to a standard user, more than likely, by getting in the click a fish link uh, or attachment. So they're likely not going to have admin privileges at the outset. So 
if you see a normal user using a command prompt in a certain way to do a registry key or what have you, whatever the technique was, that would raise suspicion. And it includes real-time monitoring. And again, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at it from the high-level view, you're thinking to yourself, man, that's a lot of stuff I'm trying to monitor. But this one here, if you want to monitor specifically for Ryuk and Wizard Spider and these other tools, you know exactly what they have used before. And you know it's likely they're going to do this again. Again, harkening back to Pyramid of Pain. So it's likely Wizard Spider and Fin6 will use the same tactics and techniques and procedures again. Okay? Very cool, very cool stuff. All right. So let me close out of that. So we went over the uh, attack framework. And we went over the different searches you can do for, let's say, Ryuk or what have you. And you can pick anything, obviously, that you want. And then over here, we have something new that just started coming out called Shield. So this is what they call active defense. And this is becoming a hotness now in the cybersecurity field. So if you want to kind of be abreast, if you will, of the new mindset that defenders and attackers are taking, is it's a proactive, a, a proactive technique called active defense. Think of it like this. I create environments to lure a bad guy in and I do certain things either to throw him off or to learn from his techniques. Now, you probably know of that as something called a honeypot and it's similar in concept. As a matter of fact, some of the different shield techniques are using honeypots. So that's kind of what shield is, but it's cool that it's mapped specifically to the MITRE ATT&CK framework because, well, MITRE made this program. So in this case here, I can look under this attack mapping and I can start looking at different things. So let's go back and look at our main issue, which is the Windows command shell. Now we see that that is under execution as the tactic, and then it's command and script and interpreter for the technique. So if we come back to shield, we know we'd come over to attack mapping, and we would look under, oh shoot, I already forgot, <laughs> uh, execution. We would come back to the map and we would look under execution. Under execution, we know that we were looking at command and script and interpreter with a sub-technique of Windows command shell. So we'll go down and look here. Command and script and interpreter is listed here. Now we would actually have to go in here and determine, well, they don't really break it down into that specific sub-technique because shoring up these certain things here will actually mitigate those as well. That's kind of a kind of a bonus. So we look here and we see there's this one, this one, and this one. I don't see any other ones. So those three in particular, we can start setting up an active defense. This is a proactive thing that you would do. So first off, let's take a look at the first one here. It says there's an opportunity. So they're going to use the word opportunity when it comes to shield. And they're going to say, we have an opportunity to be proactive in how we approach defense um, for our company. We could just sit back and monitor and let our MSPs and our, our EDR solutions do the work. Or we can proactively set up an environment to actually combat, take it to the, take it to the attacker, <laughs> essentially, right? And obviously you wouldn't tie this to real, uh, real systems that you have. These would be mostly like virtual systems and more like, you know, like a honeypot type of thing. So it says here, there's an opportunity for the defender to observe the adversary and control what they can see, what effects they can have, and or what data they can access. So that is the actual technique. And then over here, is the actual um, shield category. So there's three of them. One of us here, a defender can manipulate the output of a system command issued to alter information the adversary might use during their activity. So in other words, we're, we're giving them, we're feeding them false information. It's kind of like those spy movies or what's that TV show I used to like, uh, Alias, right? Alias was a double agent where she would go and do whatever the bad guy wanted to do, but then they would feed the real information to the CIA and give, give the bad guys dummy information to, uh, to, to, to play around with. Similar concept here. 
So let's take a look here at software manipulation. So it says here, making changes to a system software properties and functions to achieve a desired effect. It allows a defender to alter or replace elements of the operating system file system or any other software installed and executed on a system. Now, we know specifically this is the one a defender can manipulate the output of system commands. So we look for that one specifically here. So this one is here. So if we look back here, we can see there's an opportunity for the defender to observe the adversary and control what they see. And that's what this one is right there. So if you're doing this in an organized fashion, you can say D0, DOS0028 and give that to the, to, the, uh, to the team, to the incident response or the blue team and say these are what you're going to be using. And they can reference shield specifically and look for this particular one. Now down below, the use cases would be these over here on the right. Now this particular one has a use case about manipulating the output of system commands issued to alter information. So here we can see Defender can manipulate the output of system commands issued to alter information. That's the one right there. Okay, that's our number. Now there's other ones here, but they're not related according to Shields mapping to this particular technique. Okay, then down below, they can get a little more granular and they can tell you exactly how to do that. Hook the Win32 sleep function so that it always performs a sleep one instead of the intended duration. Um, here's another one about net user change password, modify, you know, all kinds of different things you can look at here to actually be proactive and make an environment where you take it to the attacker. Okay. All right. So going back here, we see again the second one. There's an opportunity for the defender to observe the adversary. So in this case, this is more of the honeypot scenario. We, we just want to see where they're going, how they're getting there, and are they trying to perform lateral movement. So if we make an environment that has six servers that are virtualized, and hopefully the bad guy doesn't use their detection techniques to determine it's a virtual machine, we're hoping that the attacker will try to do stuff and try to do lateral movement and try to do this and that so we can view and see okay, well, he used this method to get lateral movement to this machine. Okay, we need to make sure we protect against that. And they're doing it against a system that doesn't, you know, doesn't really, it's not in your production, right? So that's the idea behind it. So here we can see a defender can modify the functionality of commands used to delete files so that the files are copied to a safe location before they are deleted. In this case here, because you're manipulating what, what we're seeing in this particular one. And again, that comes under software manipulation, and you would again look for it up here in this list. So in this command here, right there, that would be the one that we're actually using for this one. And again, there's a lot more, but they're not specific mapped to this technique that we're getting into. So then we come over to the third one. It says there's an opportunity for the defender to observe the adversary and control what they can see, what effects they have, and what data they can access. This one here would be system activity monitoring. So we have a new one. Capturing system logs can show logins, user, and system events collecting this data. So in other words, you may have put out there a legitimate ID that you made, but it's a test account. And if you see the person logging in to the VPN with the test account and you caught it on logs, you now know that standard users are getting their credentials compromised and the, the attacker is using it to log into VPN to get into the network first place. So that's kind of what you would use this for, for the monitoring portion of it. So capturing system logs can show logins, user and system events, etc. Collecting this data and potentially sending it to a centralized location can help reveal the presence of an adversary and the actions they perform on a compromised system. And again, we would come back here and we would look at this and we'd see a defender can detect the presence of an adversary by monitoring for processes that are created by commands and or scripts they execute on a system. Well, we've seen that before back here, right? Where they're actually using named pipe impersonation techniques to escalate privileges. Um, Ryuk was trying to adjust by using this particular SC debug privilege. So we know that is true and that is happening with this Ryuk. So that's what we would use for our active defense. I don't know what they, the technical term for it is, but this is what we're going to call it, <laughs> active defense. And again, we have a ton of different things below here, 
but we would be specific to just this one that we were looking at from here. Okay. And again, you can come down to procedures and they'll tell you specifically here, for instance, monitor certain window systems for event codes. Um, uh, ensure the system capture and retain common system level activity. And this would actually ensure, or you could ensure, that your machines are actually logging properly and they're logging verbose enough to give you the information that you need to be able to do this. So this is a pretty cool, pretty cool thing here, the shield. It's, it's kind of new this year, I think, actually came out. And again, you can, uh, you can map it to any one of these tactics. And then from these mapped tactics, you can look at the techniques listed below, right? So this is a big one here, right? Fission. So this one here would say something like a phishing email can be detected and blocked from arriving at the intended recipient. In this case, a defender, that would be us, can intercept emails that are detected as suspicious or malicious by email detection tools and prevent the delivery to the intended target. So that's using some sort of MTA to be able to go ahead and view the sender authentication and using things like DKIM and SPF and all that stuff to verify sender, ver sender authentication or verification. And that's what they're talking about here. But then this one here is talking about moving mails to a decoy system prior to opening. So this would be something that's very common. Well, it's starting to be common nowadays is that these email uh, MTA solutions are actually doing sandboxing where they'll say, okay, if the user does open an attachment like they're not supposed to do, we're going to open it in a sandbox. So if it does actually trigger something or create a process, it's going to happen in the sandbox only and not on the actual local machine. So this would be an example of taking a proactive step of sandboxing certain email stuff or attachments that are listed there. And uh, 0365 has that ability, but I'm not sure if they use Hyper-V technology to do that sandbox. So if they do, that, <laughs> that's another thing all into itself because then you have to enable Hyper-V and, and all that stuff. But it's an example of, you know, if you use Office 365, they do that. They, they do have that ability to, to open those up in a different, in a different sandbox environment. Um, so, yeah, you can see deco decoy persona. That's an interesting one there. So basically, we're seeding information. We're making a, an account or a credential that's attractive to an attacker. Um, we're making it and seeding it with information that this person has a ton of keys to the kingdom information. And we're hoping that the bad guy is going to go after them with like a whaling technique or something. We kind of make them appear to be like a C-level executive or things like that. You're making a decoy persona and you're looking to see, did they compromise that? And are they using it to try to log in as an administrator through the VPN, that sort of thing? So you already are in the know and you're saying, I know about this persona account. And you also know how to set up your monitoring because you're going to be specific and say, I'm monitoring this decoy persona. If it ever is used anywhere on my network at all, today, tomorrow, next week, I know somebody fell for it, somebody's using it, and attackers are trying to get in using some whaling technique or some sort of thing like that, that's what you would set these up for. So that's kind of your honey token, honey person. I don't know what you would call it, but that's the decoy stuff. But anyways, Shield has all of these things listed here. It's just, it's loaded with information. It's like, it's like there's no real reason why you wouldn't use MITRE for, for creating your incident response and your cyber threat intel. Anytime at my workplace, like at, like at my workplace, I've been asked, a few times to come up with proactive steps for Ryuk and TrickBot and this and that. And I create documents based off of what I see here, right? I, I map out things and I give them a specific checklist. And I say the Windows team needs to be monitoring for PowerShell usage. The Windows team needs to be looking to see if any encoded PowerShell happens because Ryuk, uh, an example of, I'm sorry, Emotet, is that Emotet, once it's downloaded or downloads the executable, it'll actually download that executable by making and creating a uh, obfuscated base64 encoded PowerShell command that does a net web client that reaches out and, and downloads it. So I tell my people at the place I work at, I say, okay, Windows team, is there any use case at all where we need to use base64 encoding? 
on PowerShell? I mean, any usage at all for that? And if the answer, and the answer was no, then I say, okay, it's pretty easy now to know what to monitor for because this is an anomaly. This is something that's not normal. So now they are monitoring using, you know, specifically for base 64 encoded. Because if I see that pop up, I know it's not normal everyday activity at my company. And I know based off of my miter and, and, and all the different things I've done here, I know that Emotet uses it to download TrickBot executables. And they do it with this obfuscated base 64 encoded PowerShell command. So I immediately know, bing, okay, that's probably Ryuk or something like that. We need to be on top of this bad boy. And that's what makes this thing so useful. So if you are in cyber threat intel at your workplace, or if you do any type of incident response, I don't know what you guys do for yours, but if you do any of that sort of thing, this is this would be a great tool for you to set up for playbooks and such. Like my incident response team at my workplace, they love it when I give them step-by-step, -step, you know, procedures to do to use to, to make a playbook for ransomware. I can break it up into sections and I can say, today let's tackle this, access token manipulation. And I can kind of tell them, all right, here's here's what the mitigations are. Let's start working on this. You know, you, Smojo, Leroy Jenkins, you're you're responsible for doing this and, and setting up this policy here. And you, you're you're responsible for user account management, right? So now you've got a plan. And now you can prevent, hopefully prevent, ransomware because you already know, right? G.I. Joe said no one's have the battle, right? In this case here, the bad guys are going to be coming at you with this stuff and you're going to be saying, I already know what you're trying to do, player. Ain't going to happen. Get to stepping, right? That's what we're looking to do. <laughs> so in this case, that's that. Now, MITRE does have another thing as well that I don't use very often because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not formatted very well, but it's called uh, CAR. And it's for analytics. So they've already kind of grabbed a ton of these different ones. So for instance, if you look here and you look under mitigations, they give you these two. If you look under detection, they give you some specific things. But if you want to go beyond that, they do have something called cyber analytics where they've already taken some of these techniques and they've already applied a lot of different analytics to it and get more detailed. The only thing I don't like about it is it's not really that well searchable. And it doesn't seem to, I don't know how to do the number. I see the attack technique, but not all the attack techniques are here, right? But we'll just pick one. So this command and script and interpreter is a pretty common one, right? Processes spawn in command.exe. So if we look at this, it will now tell you a lot of information about this particular issue. And then down here, <clears throat> excuse me, it starts talking about some pseudocode to kind of give you an idea of how you would script some mitigation or some protection for it. And then it gets really verbose down below about what you're looking to do and what you're looking to do for, you know, your system admins and your Windows admins for it. So that's another thing you can use, Cyber Analytics Repository. But in, uh, in reality, like I said, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to navigate and they don't actually have everything in there. Um, but you can use it for some, right? Now, uh, for the red team portion of it, I recommend, and you can see I'm wearing my red canary. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see that. But uh, red canary gave me this t-shirt. So I'm not really plugging them, but I am because they're pretty cool. But red canary has something they call uh, atomic red team. So if you do have a red team and you want to do you want to do attack simulations based off of MITRE, uh, this is, in my opinion, one of the best ways to do it. Um, so the Red Canary, it's called, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember now what I just called it. Uh, red Canary Atomic, Red Team, and it's on GitHub. Uh, let's see if this is the one. Yes. Okay, so let's pretend we're using Windows and we want to test Windows with our red teams. What you can do is you can go ahead and look at this here. Now, it doesn't actually have every technique covered with a test, but again, you can have your red team come up with their own. But I've used this in the past for tabletops. So for example, I had a particular one that I wanted to try, which was this one here. So group policy preferences. 
Now, in this particular one, this is a pretty old one, a pretty old tactic and technique here. But <laughs> the basics of this is that if we allow local admin accounts to be created through group policy preferences, they were being stored in Sysball and they were being stored in a particular file. And you can actually query that using PowerShell and see the AES encrypted uh, credential. Now you're probably thinking, well, I mean, it's the AES key. That's, that's awesome. I mean, we can't, they can't crack that. Well, unfortunately, Windows in their infinite wisdom <laughs> publicly listed out the AES key on a website. So on their own blogs, they gave up the keys to the kingdom. Uh, and to this day, I don't know what happened with that and what the deal is with that. But essentially, we can use the AES key that they use to decrypt the credentials that are found with GPP preferences. So if I wanted to test our company with a real attack simulation of a bad guy using this to get GPP preferences and to get a local admin credential so they can log into a local admin server and then pivot to other servers with, with uh, lateral movement. As a red team, it tells you exactly what you should do. It tells you the supported platforms, run this with command prompt, and you would do this to kind of get the information that you need. And then from there, you can decrypt using the AES key that's on there. Pretty awesome stuff. Here's another one here. You can use PowerShell. And sometimes they'll give you the URL. What I would do if you were using this is I would verify by going to these because some of these I came across were no longer there, but it looks like they are. So you want to test if you're being detected as a red team downloading files like this from an unknown location using PowerShell. If it's unfettered and they don't really care and they're not monitoring or stopping you, that's an issue you need to bring up with the team. You need to go ahead and say, hey, listen, this is what I did. I went and blasted away and I did the PowerShell thing and I grabbed this and I found credentials for local admins. And so the incident response team would be like, okay, well, what do we do? Well, in that case, we know the number in MITRE. So what we do is we copy that and we tell them, okay, go to MITRE, put in that technique and eventually it will show up. There it is. And then we can see unsecured credentials, group policy preferences. It tells you information over here and we can see you don't need to be admin for it. Pretty crazy, right? Here it talks about people that have done it before, the procedures, and then down below, here it is, mitigation. Remove this. <laughs> In other words, don't let people create local admin accounts with group policy. Uh, and delete what was in there, populated in there previously, because that's one issue is people will go and disable this with the patch that came out in 2014 for this. That's how old it is. But they'll forget to go back and actually remove what was already in the XML file to begin with. So it shows up. So this is the knowledge base. It's telling you, make sure that you apply this patch. These are good things that you would then give to your red, your blue team and say, listen, I blasted you guys using group policy preferences, but here's how you can stop me next time. And this is how you should have used to detect these sort of things. Okay. So that's where you can pull this stuff in. So this atomic red team is pretty sweet and they do have a ton of tests, but there are some, like I said, that are not here, but you can contribute one if you know something you want to use, but you can see there's a whole slew of them and they're all broken in to their tactic. See that? See right there? Credential access. That's one of the tactics. So that's pretty awesome. Defense evasion is one I like to use a lot at my uh, workplace right here. So sometimes I'll do like a bits admin job, like right here, bits job, and I'll do this particular one. So this is a great red team stuff. If you guys have a red team or if you're interested in uh, volunteering yourself at your workplace to do it, right? You can go ahead and say, listen, I'll, I'll test our local network and see if we're vulnerable to this nonsense. So yeah. Pretty wild stuff. So all in all, that comes down to, to look at this and say, hey, this might have attack, man. This is, this, is the, this is it, man. This is the real deal. So what do you guys think of that? A lot of information to consume. <laughs> uh, but that's pretty much the skinny of it here. But uh, before we log off on this, I'll see if you guys have some questions. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm going to plan on doing some more of these, and I'm going to learn a little bit better about how to do YouTube stuff <laughs> as far as YouTube Live. Um, maybe put out some, what, what are they called? Alerts, right? Tip jar, whatever. <laughs> all that kind of cool stuff. I'm going to try to figure out how to do all that stuff and make it look pretty cool, pretty sweet. But hopefully uh, everything was good with this. The sound was good and the video was good and you guys got some good instruction here. So do you guys have any questions for me? And do you like the format of what we're doing here? Should I do another one? Maybe do like a, a capture the flag in real time and discuss one of my capture the flags that I've done before where I've broken into it and teach you the techniques being used to break into a machine. Would that be something you guys be interested in? So let me know in the chat. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's always a good idea to go ahead and present this to them. And it's, uh, it's only going to be a feather in your cap when you go and say to leadership, hey, listen, I saw this video last night, man, about this miter attack. We really should be implemented here at Workplace. Who knows? You may get a raise, bro. <laughs> That'd be pretty sweet. Pretty sweet stuff. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I'm glad it went good and the audio and video were good. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'll try to pretty it up a little bit and try to do some different stuff with it as well. But I do plan on trying to do some of the stuff I have on my YouTube video, but do it live. Because usually, you know, there'll be a lot of questions. Like if I do a capture the flag, they'd be like, can you explain that? Well, why'd you do that? So it'd be good to do some capture the flags live, I think. So maybe we'll do this once or twice a week along with my regular YouTube videos. But this will be posted here in my, in my channel. So if you ever want to come back to this again or if you want to show your, your boss at your workplace, hey, listen, let's watch this video and let me show you kind of what, what he was doing there. Feel free to use any of it. And uh, tell all your friends about us. Subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to get over 1,000 subscribers so I can uh, get some monetization and some other cool features of YouTube. <laughs> all right, very cool. Well, I'm glad you guys came out. Um, I don't see the other ones. I don't know, but I don't see the names or anything. I see there's four in chat. So hopefully the rest of you guys enjoyed it. And I'm going to stick around for a few minutes just to see if you have any questions. And if not, I'll go ahead and end the stream in about five minutes. Uh, other than that, Keep on popping. Peace out, players. And you can you can ask any questions you want here while I'm kind of sitting around. While we're waiting on that, I'll blast another tune for my sweet music to hack by to kind of take us out. If I can know how to spell my website name. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to mute my microphone.